Hello and welcome to this episode of the Fertility Podcast. I'm Natalie Silverman, your host. I'm going to have to be really quick with this intro because I've just heard my husband say he's about to mow the lawn and um, that's not going to sound that great whilst I'm trying to chat with you. So I just wanted to welcome you if this is your first listen to the Fertility Podcast. My aim is to educate and empower you with stories of other men and women sharing their fertility struggles as well as experts giving you real insight into maybe the next steps that you're looking to take. And if you like what you hear, I'd love it if you take a moment and just subscribe to this podcast and you can rate and review it in your favorite podcast app. It just helps other people find this podcast because the more reviews it gets, the more it pops up in different places. So um, if you've got a minute, it's always ace to know what you think. It's really hard to gauge how many of you uh, listen unless you subscribe. So keep doing that ace to have your support now if you've just found the fertility podcast there's over 200 episodes for you to have a listen back to what you're going to hear today is another conversation that i've had with kate davis who is a fertility nurse and has been hosting the podcast with me now for a couple of months and we're also sharing on uk health radio which is an internet radio station as well as here on the fertility podcast so it's a bit different from what i've been doing up until now kate has obviously a lot of experience working with people day to day about different issues affecting their fertility and i was really keen to kind of have a co-host on the podcast so if you've been listening for a while and you just heard me chatting to people when well i can hear kate and i chatting to people and there's going to be all sorts of interesting things happening with the fertility podcast as i head into my fifth year so be sure to follow me on instagram at fertility body twitter it's at fertility body and uh, if you're a facebook fan there's the fertility podcast facebook page now we're going to hear a conversation that kate and i have had with a lady called kelly de silva who has an organization called the dove coat and kelly works with men and women supporting them uh, she's talking to us about her own fertility struggles and reaching the end of her fertility journey and how that's led her on to working with others and also working with uh, a big clinic in the UK called Care. So wherever you're at in your journey, I think some of the things that Kelly talks about are so relevant and important to take on board, even if you're just kind of starting out. We talk a lot about how it's so often that when you're trying to conceive, it takes over everything and you don't get to enjoy stuff. Some really good advice. So whatever you're up to, whether you're on the move or whether you're sitting and just listening, enjoy the show and be sure to check out the show note details at the end. So Kate, here we are again, getting our talk fertility hats on, and we are about a month in to this show. It's been it's been a fascinating experience, hasn't it? It really has. I can't believe I can't believe we're a month in, but I'm loving every minute of it. It's a brilliant opportunity for the pair of us to speak to such a wide range of people, and we've shared in the in the previous week's chats with experts such as Professor Luciano Nardo talking about unexplained infertility. More recently, we just had a film director talking about a beautiful film, Only You, which is on theatrical release. We're, we're trying to show that variety of conversations that happen in this fertility space because they are broad, aren't they? Oh, indeed, yeah. And I have to say, all of them have been so fascinating so far, and I've loved listening back to them. Now, one of the things that you're really passionate about in your day-to-day work, and I am in the work I create with the content that I share, is providing support. And we we do it in different ways. And it's a a lovely union that we've got because you work with patients. And I know you also work in a face-to-face way. And we were chatting before because you saw your group last night, didn't you? Yeah, so I have a local fertility support, support group, which is part of Fertility Network UK, so part of the charity. And I run it um, for them. Um, in um, Stamford, my local town, and there's this this group has grown from initially I think three ladies on our first one to now really about about ten, and it's growing every week. I get more and more emails of people that want to join us, and I'm I was so delighted to start doing it because for me it's giving something back. Um, and particularly giving something back to my local community, which is really important to me. So last night we had um, a social meetup actually, rather than our normal um, group. And our whole ethos of our fertility support group is whilst we'll spend time talking about fertility, particularly in the more, um, I'd say formal meetings, but clearly they're not formal at all, but the more formal meetings. Um, But in our meetups, that is really all about having an awful lot of fun, a lot of laughter and joy and happiness, which I'm really, really keen to do that I think that life has to be 
more than just being about fertility. You have to be living your life and enjoying life. So part of um, the things that we do within the group is that we'll have guest speakers, but it might not always be that we have a guest speaker about a fertility related topic. We could have something completely different, like a pottery class or one of our members is a photographer and she's going to take pictures of us, which is fantastic. Um, so last night was amazing. We got together. They were asking loads of questions about the radio show and I know they're all enjoying listening to it as well, which is great. So hi, girls. <laughs> I think it's really lovely to hear you talking about the fun and the laughter and the joy because especially if you're listening to this show because you found that you're struggling to conceive and you're looking for information and it can seem all-consuming there can be friendships that will develop out of this talking Mm. to people and then remembering that you know life does go on this is a really rubbish situation that you found yourself in and and I love that that's something that you've created and the reason we're talking about this is because it's very relevant to our guests that we're going to be talking to today but I just wanted to mention another event that I'm involved with because Kate and I um, we create the show remotely because Kate as she said in in Stamford in in the UK which is kind of Midlands-ish for people that are listening outside the UK is that yep. fair to say? I'm based yep, in Manchester, so, so I'm in the Northwest, and I'm actually involved in putting on some events. We've got one coming up later in August for the LGBT community. And it's really interesting looking at putting this out because there's not really very much information for you if you're in a same-sex relationship or if you're 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 gay and you're just wondering what your options might be. And so the point of the meetup that we're doing is to help you meet other people and help you ask questions. And and really what Kate and I want to do is by talking about these kind of meetups is help you realise that um, there's lots out there and we'll put the link to Fertility mm. Network UK um, in in the show notes for this episode and our guest today is somebody who through their own fertility um, struggles has created a whole support network herself very focused on not having children we're going to be talking later in the year about world childless week because that is something that happens in september but this lady's called kelly de silva and kate i know that you have a friend who has personal experience of working with kelly um yeah. I-, I know kelly i've spoken to her before she's very outspoken she's done a lot of work in the media when did you first hear about her um, I think from um, Instagram and also from my friend Caroline, who's actually a friend of hers. Um, and I think Caroline mentioned actually because she's Kelly doesn't live that far away from us, is getting her to come along to our fertility support group. So that'll be a question that I'll be asking her a bit later on. Well, make sure we share all of Kelly's details in the show notes for this episode. And here she is. So welcome to Kelly De Silva. Kelly is the founder of the Dovecote Childless Support Organisation. And as Kate and I were just mentioning in our intro, she provides amazing support and has her own story to share as well. And we were really keen, Kelly, to talk more about where you're at, how you are and what you're doing to help others. So welcome to Talk Fertility. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great. Hi, Kelly. Hi. And one of the places that it makes the most sense to start, Kelly, really, is is about your story, because it's been lengthy, there's been a lot of ups and downs, but it's led you to this point now where you are doing amazing work. Do you want to just tell us about what you've been through? Yeah, absolutely. It was kind of a 10-year mammoth journey, really. Um, started trying to conceive um, just after I got married, so um, in my mid 20s so quite early compared to some people these days um largely unexplained infertility especially initially whilst we were under the nhs so that led us to having four months of clomid on the final month of clomid we actually got pregnant but sadly 11 weeks i miscarried um obviously that was devastating but at the same time it was my first pregnancy so felt really positive that actually moving forward that it could work um we then went on to have three um cycles of iui which unfortunately um were unsuccessful so at that stage we really had to make a decision about what was next and by this time we'd already been under the nhs for quite a while and um my emotional health and um, it really started to suffer because of it obviously the stress of having to go through this um was really i was finding it really tricky so we were entitled to one cycle of ivf 
on the NHS. Um, we were due to start. I met my, my consultant who had the prescription. And at that point, he said, this is your prescription, but you can't have it because the CCGs run out of money for this cycle. So unfortunately, you're going to have to go into a further waiting list. And at that point, I just felt absolutely devastated. It was kind of like, what do we do? What do we do next? Let's just stop so, one second, Kelly, if we may. Just if, if people are listening and they don't really understand the reference to the CCG, um, what, what Kelly was just referring to was the, the funding availability of, of NHS treatment. And Kate, you've got an experience of working in the NHS. And we have this term, the postcode lottery, which you may well have heard about in the press, which is depending on where you live in the UK, it determines what accessibility you have to funded IVF cycles. But to be at that point, Kelly, where you think you've got it and then it's denied is is heartbreaking. Yeah. It is when it's taken away from you. And I know that now, especially across the UK, it's something in England that is being taken away from a lot of people. And it is a postcode lottery. So it was a really, really difficult time. And we kind of assessed things and we decided that actually we were going to pay privately for ourselves just because of the emotional impact that it taken on both of us, really. So we continued to have treatment. We, we moved over to care fertility to have that privately. We had a cycle which failed. And at that point, I felt like something was just wrong. Something wasn't quite right. Nobody could tell me what was happening. I'd had lots of investigations, but there was nothing conclusive. So at that point, after our first cycle, I stopped to have some um, immune testing. I'd done lots of research. So there's lots of uh, media coverage out there at the moment about add-ons. But for me, having the immune testing and natural killer cells was actually something that I'd researched, something that I suggested and something that I really felt passionately about doing, even though it was really expensive. So that came back, actually, that I did have elevated natural killer cells and other cells that were going on. So that could potentially mean that the embryo um, was being attacked by my na- my natural killer cells and I must say you know leading to that point I I have felt in the past that I have been pregnant but then I'd get my period so um for me I have got other autoimmune issues going on so it, it kind of made sense so following that kind of diagnosis if you like we continued to have another cycle with um, immune therapy so I had steroids blood thinners and um, at that point I had the intralipid um, infusions as well which again suppresses the immune system and to my amazement actually got a positive pregnancy test so was absolutely delighted when was getting all the pregnancy symptoms went for the six week scan and unfortunately the pregnancy wasn't viable even though I've been getting all these symptoms it just wasn't viable so I went into that room thinking it was the first time we'd had two embryos put back so is it going to be one is it going to be two never considering that there might be nothing there and there there no pregnant you know there'd be no pregnancy so I was utterly again devastated um and that took quite a while to process obviously you kind of you've got the the heartbreak of it but then on the other in the other side of it it felt like we'd given it given us something to actually fix so we did continue to have two further cycles in our own mind mind we'd said that we'd have three cycles but we did have a frozen embryo transfer but unfortunately those two final cycles failed as well and at that point emotionally physically financially we were just done and I think more so the emotional side it was just it just completely taken its toll over the over the nearly 10 years that we were on the journey that's a long time isn't it 10 years goodness me Mm. so Kelly at what point during that 10 years did you decide to set up the dove cut so it was it was at the end of it and um so for me it was a case of the final cycle I actually left a whole year where I did absolutely nothing I didn't have any treatment I just I think we'd we'd got completely sick of putting our life on hold and that's something that I hear a lot from from people that I support that they feel like their life's on hold they can't plan anything move jobs move house just in case and for, for us that was certainly the case we'd had a whole year where actually we did really fun things we, we booked lovely holidays and we just gave ourselves a break do you know what? Kelly, I, I hear this all the time from my patients that they they're just constantly putting their life on hold. They don't want to book that holiday 
because they feel that they could Just potentially be going through an IVF cycle yeah. or they could be pregnant so they don't want to take the risk or they don't want to take that job promotion and life is just miserable and you look back on that year that wasted year and think why did I why did I put my life on hold like this absolutely um, I see it so yeah. commonly I've just written a blog about it on my website actually because oh, it's really? something that I just see so frequently yeah and how yeah. important it is just to avoid the temptation to put life on hold and just to try to learn to live your life while you're going well, through well absolutely because um, I think for me I think the biggest challenge was that I felt completely identified by my infertility mm. and um, at the end it's such and, a label isn't it oh it absolutely and I think once once I did do our final cycle um I think logically we thought well we can just get on with our lives now and we thought you know once we got that result either way it would make that decision but actually finding out um, that it hadn't worked on the last day of our holiday in Cornwall uh, oh. five years ago um, and having a dream the night before that it had worked was just absolutely devastating so oh, um, it was it was crushing and the, the period that followed was a really dark three months um, I remember quite vividly my husband he he went away to Singapore for a few days and it was just the best thing that could have happened because I was able just to lie in bed and just wallow and it was just what I needed you just yeah. I just needed to feel what I was feeling yeah. complete grief complete loss um, and the question was kind of now what now what do I do I'd always imagined being a mother always having a family so I was in a really kind of period of and I guess a stage of my life where I couldn't see that there was any hope I couldn't see that there was any joy to be had I couldn't see that there was any future um and people say you know they have often feel a sense of kind of feeling like a failure felt all those things sad lost but you know it did get to the to the stage where you just I actually thought I don't want to be here anymore and that isn't uncommon for people going through this journey um sadly um so for me um I'd always been a very kind of proactive person and, and liked to look at the positives and um I was really lucky at the time that I had incredible support from the clinic from my counsellor I had emotional freedom technique it's a bit like acupuncture without the needle so it's tapping on acupressure points mm -hmm. of the body and that really lifted the sadness that I was feeling because at the end of those nearly 10 years it was just I felt like I was sat under a huge sad cloud um, mm -hmm. and I just couldn't move forward so having that support um I was active online and communities so that was really useful having that community to kind of be there and to help me through that but but I, I think it was a case of I needed to feel those feelings there was some people run away from it some people keep busy but I'm a feeler and I needed to feel it in order to kind of try and heal what we'd been through. I think the behaviour change aspect of this though is a key thing that is really important to highlight when you've been at the this this desperate place and such depths of despair to enable yourself you know you were lucky that you 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 found it within the support you had at the clinic but these techniques that you were able to take on and use and feel a difference and I hope that that speaks quite um, strongly to people listening that there are these array of, of of different methods that different practitioners and coaches and counsellors suggest but it's really good to hear that from that dark place you found something and I know you've become a practitioner of, of the EFT and NLP work as well haven't you? Absolutely and it was something because it was so helpful for me something so quick and easy that I felt really passionately about helping and supporting other people and it can be used for a range of um, different um, things but anxiety, depression, phobias but for me it was just it kind of just really released and shifted the energy around the sadness and I felt like I say, at that time, um, a real struggle and resisting um, my situation rather than accepting what it was, I was resisting against it. So it just helped me release that a little bit, not completely let go, because I don't think it's something that you ever, ever get over, but we learn to live with. So at that point, because of these techniques, I felt really passionately, actually, that um, I wanted to kind of help other people. But when I got to the end of my journey without 
a child uh, without the baby and uh, you know the miracle baby that I'd always hoped for and um, there seemed a distinct lack of support out there and at the time um, five years ago four or five years ago people weren't talking about childlessness in the same way that they are today. It was still, you know, a lot of stigma around it, um, lots of negative connotations about what it means to be a childless person. So as well as kind of the lack of support out there, there was also the social challenges, being with people, you know, getting to go into their 30s who are starting to have families, family members and friends. It's it's really tricky. It's really hard. So um, I felt really passionately about creating a community where people could actually say, yeah, we get it. And I remember the first time that I, I set up the online community and it was just there was people on there that was just I thought I was alone and that's again that resonated with me so a lot of my work has, has kind of been really healing to myself um, as well as helping other people on there and that's grown to nearly a thousand people on the childless right. community mm-hmm. the dovecote community that I run the private Facebook group where did the name the dovecote come from how did you come so, up with that so I kind of love the sim. I love the symbol of the dove, and uh, the dovecote is a place where it's kind of very spiritual. Um, but I also live in a house called the dovecote, so it's kind of got that personal um, meaning for me. So yeah, perfect. So that group, the thousand members, is that a Facebook group? Where do, is that an online? Group? It is. Yeah, that's that's an online Facebook private group. If um, you just search for the Dovecote community, that should pop up with um, a little picture of some edible, delicious biscuits that one of our members um, makes. Um, Caroline's Caroline. biscuits. So <laughs> yes, so we've got her lovely Caroline's biscuits um, as the little picture on there. So you should be able to find that quite easily, or you can find it by going to my Facebook page. Page, the Dovecote Community Childless Support Organisation and it is linked in there too. So just talk a bit about the support that you give and it's not just women is it? It's The idea is it's for couples because yeah. I know that you and your husband dealt with it in, in different ways but you dealt with it together didn't you? We, we did yeah and I think um, to begin with it was a case of it, he went into the kind of protection role um, because I was in a really tricky place. So I think having the Dovecote community where I could share and, um, you know, let off steam and um, just have that supportive environment kind of let him off a little bit to begin with um, because it was a case of, ah, oh, I've got a place where I didn't feel like I was constantly having to kind of chat to him about what was going on. Um, and men and women are different. I found that particularly my husband it was very much it was in a little box and it was closed and he didn't want to go there too often because we decided yeah you know it was it was it was also it's it's very logical so it was a case of can we can't do anything to control that we've done all that we can and you know we don't have any regrets about what we did you know there, there are things today that are available that weren't available when we had treatment but I have no desire to go back and have treatment myself and feel really passionately that actually that my journey's led me to a place where I can, you know, there's a purpose to it. Um, so I've moved from teaching to do what I'm doing now, which involves supporting people who are in this similar situation. But not only that, it's about, and Natalie, you'll know with a lot of the work that we've done over the over the few years about the raising awareness mm-hmm. and getting mm-hmm. people to talk about it. So I remember um chatting to Jodie Day who runs the Gateway Women and um, she said you know I really need people who would be media volunteers I said I'm happy to share my story because at that time again nobody wanted to talk about it there was such shame um, about having this label and not being able to have children so when I did that the response I got was incredible and when I've done other bits and pieces like BBC Breakfast for Fertility Awareness Week people would just completely unaware that there was support out there Um, and I know the community is much bigger today um, but again there's still people out there that still feel alone who I hopefully can reach out because of um, the work that you're doing and the work that we're all doing to kind of help raise awareness about fertility issues and childlessness. 
I think the term as well, it's this involuntary Involuntary, involuntary, involuntary yeah. childlessness. Yeah. It's not really a very nice term, is it? I mean, I know it's it, it's honest and open and says what it is, but it's just it just sounds so yeah. unfair. And it, it, I suppose yeah. it is unfair, isn't it? It is absolutely unfair. And I think, you know, I look at all the lovely people that I've met through my journey and the work that I now do, and they're just amazing. And you just think it's, they don't deserve to be in this situation, but it's kind of, it is, it is what it is. And there isn't, at the moment, there isn't another term for it. Mm. And it's quite funny, actually, when I was at a a little meetup two nights ago, I was with and some ladies that we've we've been kind of support I've been supporting them and they've been supporting each other now for um a good 18 months and um I I have my niece and nephews a lot I have 10 nieces and nephews and um so that's but that's been quite it's been a blessing and it's been quite tricky at times over over the last 14 years but yeah I have a lot of children um that are kind of in my life and they said well you're not really childless are you are you and I'm like no I've not I've got a very childless life I have a very child full life I think I worked out in the last 10 days I've had one of my nieces nephews one two or three of them stay at least seven nights and done things with them because of inset days so um I'm really lucky in that in that sense that actually I don't feel like I have a massive gap um, but again that's been a bit to do with my mindset because it has been tricky with with my nieces and nephews being born particularly when my sister was pregnant at the same time as me and so I've got an an eight and a half year old niece who would have been the same age as our little one so that's been quite tricky but we have an incredible bond with her because of that so it's really nice to have that but again it's it takes time to process it and I've learned to actually focus on what I can control that's been so important and there's so many things I was a terrible worry I'd worry about everything but actually through the neuro-linguistic programming the NLP techniques and the EFT I've really been able to shift my mindset to appreciate and be really grateful for the things I do have in my life rather than focusing on the things I don't have and that can it's not it just it's not something that happens overnight it's something that really takes time one of the things that I've been reading about you Kelly and the work that you're doing and and this I guess really fits in with the kind of mindset and shifting your mindset is about the events that you run the walk and talk events um Mm -hmm. and they just sound so lovely can you tell us a little bit more about those and also where you're holding them because I'm sure some of our listeners in the UK would just love to get involved with that Yes, of course. So as as well as my um, work with the Dovecote Childless Support Organisation, and we, we do run work, um, walk and talks for those, um, I felt really passionately about providing additional support for those people who were still on the IVF journey, which you might think is a bit strange considering that I finished my journey, but I felt like it was a way of turning my situation into something positive. So I've been working um, at Care Fertility for the last three years and developed a range of support offerings um, for patients who are undergoing IVF or fertility treatment not just IVF or fertility treatments so we um I now run is that that for anyone Kelly or Um, or is it just for women with care so it's for men and women that can come along to those um and it's not just care so we okay non-patients can also take part in those um great so we have a monthly walk and talk event which um we because we're rolling out the support offerings now across our clinics we've got them based in nottingham chatsworth we've got a new one in regent's park we've got one coming up in birmingham so and the one at chatsworth in particular is lovely and draws people from a range of different clinics and areas basically we meet about 11 o'clock we do a little 5k walk it's really informal sometimes ladies come on their own often we have um, couples that come along they range from two people to ten people at the moment and it's just a really lovely way of meeting other people in a really informal relaxed setting who are going through the journey and you know when you do meet other people that are going through it there's it's kind of a, a boundaries just already like kind of um 
broken down because you just get it and you just understand and um, what it is they're going through so it's a really lovely safe space to be able to chat and it's all about my work at care is about peer-to-peer -peer support so it's not counseling they offer counseling there but it is about peer-to-peer -peer support so it's being able to chat to another somebody else who's going through the fertility journey um and then after the little walk we we sit and have coffee usually for about an hour and chat a little bit more which is quite nice if you've not managed to get round everybody in the group um so yeah it's just a lovely way of kind of getting outdoors getting some fresh air but also getting that peer-to-peer -peer support from other people and kelly do you think that by changing the setting kate talked earlier about having these kind of social meetups and the idea is the emphasis on joy and we're talking about being at one with nature and i know from just giving myself time to go and have a few nice walks which is something that you know we take for granted maybe don't do enough that that's encouraging the conversation if people are really reluctant to you know to admit their feelings and to to share what's really going on that abstract setting almost just takes you out of what's really going on absolutely and I think there's something really powerful about the side to side walking with people side to side mm. rather than face to face we know that counselling is incredibly powerful but it isn't for everybody not all patients take it up it's not available in all clinics so it's really great to be in a in a kind of a neutral setting that's away from the clinic um, which is beautiful you know the settings that we we choose are really really beautiful stunning places and it's just people have just said you know as a result of it that they've been able to kind of get on with their next um cycle just having that support from other people it just gives them that encouragement um and that it's reassuring to know that every emotion that they're feeling is normal and that they're not alone so again it's just having that I'm not going mad I remember that feeling distinctly I felt like I was going mad in the middle of it all <laughs> I know when I, you know, if I go for a dog walk on my own, sometimes I might have my best ideas about anything when I'm out walking because it's that freedom, that kind of headspace. And also I know that I can also have the best conversations with my husband when we go out walking the dog because yeah. there's no other distractions. <laughs> it's really lovely, isn't it, to be out in nature. Um, I'm just looking at a lovely picture on the care website that, that on the walk and talks bit on page. And it's just a lovely picture of kind of like a autumnal, setting and it just makes it look so appealing I want to come yeah no it is it's so beautiful and um the fact that you know I think people have been initially if they were reluctant or nervous about it as soon as they meet you know the group the people there you know it's just it's, it's such a relaxing setting because we know how stressful and all-consuming fertility treatment can be so it's just completely different which I think is really nice so yeah the walk and talk's great and as well as that I also run an, a monthly online Skype but also a buddy system so people will opt in to have a care buddy um, I'll buddy them up with somebody who who's at a similar stage of treatment so they're able to kind of contact one another on WhatsApp or meet I've had ladies that have gone on holiday together that have kind of been buddying up for quite a while now and um, have just got that real friendship that you that we've talked about. One of the things that I think is really important to just focus on because when you're talking and and working with people who are still trying to start their families in this support way there's that inevitable point that there is going to be pregnancy announcements and I'm interested in how personally you cope with that how you also help the people that you're with cope with that and Kate I know it's something that you experience and have, have, have been having really recently conversations about it in your support group and I think for people listening who might be nervous about that when you build these precious friendships through this journey that then telling them good news could be something you might be terrified of losing the friendship. I think um, from my experience when you shared a journey that's so personal with people who are going through a similar journey the friendships are so special that are created uh, they have a different understanding and empathy for what you've been on completely understand completely get it so when those announcements do come hopefully you're kind of in a place where you you are really you are happy for them I I do feel feel and, and, and have seen that the reaction to people within the group who've got pregnant has just been delight of course there'll always be that element of sadness for people 
um, because inevitably we always wanted that for ourselves. However, because you've been part of that journey, in my experience, it's been a really positive and supportive and just um, it, it's, it's amazing for people. And it also gives other people hope that it can actually work um, in terms of when you have the, the announcements. I think it's really important that you have an element of self-care so whether that's people on Facebook that have announced from family members or um, friends you know Facebook have a wonderful thing called unfollow so you, you don't have to unfriend you can you can stay friends with them but you can unfollow so you don't have to see the um, bombardment of, diff, of, of pictures and you can interact when you want to so again it's about what can you can control you can control what you see on Instagram you know you can mute you can you can unfollow you can hide um, posts and things like that so it's about that self-preservation because it can be difficult it can be hard um you know giving yourself that space and self-care it's not about um necessarily being selfish but it's a healthy selfishness so I know people who have got friends who and they've been invited to baby showers it's a thing that just they find so difficult how do you say I can't come or I don't want to come. Um, so I've really, I've learned over the years that actually we have to not learn to say no, but practice saying no and protecting ourselves, you know, whether that means making other plans so you don't have to go, but actually putting yourself in a situation at a baby shower where it's going to be completely um, overwhelming maybe, unless you actually want to be there then you don't have to go. And um, that's been one of the biggest things for me that actually that I would really struggle with that. So I've had to learn to say, actually, that's not for me. And the people that love you, the friends that know that what you've been through will understand that. They'll, they'll, they'll get that. So Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Kelly. And going back to what you're saying about being happy for somebody, I think it's absolutely possible and very conflicting, but absolutely possible to be really really happy for somebody like de absolutely delighted but equally desperately sad for yourself yeah. as well and I know in my fertility support group in my Stanford local face-to-face -face group and also in my I had a Facebook group for many years and I no longer do but I, I did and, and one of the kind of the ground rules that I set in the Facebook and also we set together in my local group is that we will support the bad and celebrate the good and one of our ladies has recently conceived and she announced it last night to the group and was terribly worried about it really really anxious um, but the group were delighted for her and I know I, I have no doubt that there'll be some that probably went home that night and thought oh, so not fair but and everyone was cried. genuinely delighted yeah. for her yeah and possibly yeah. cried but that's okay you know but yeah, yeah I think that Absolutely. it's so special and that's what and I think that's that's the thing to reiterate that you can feel you can feel happy for people and sad at the same time and it's it's mm. I don't think there's any emotion there isn't a, a name for for that emotion but yeah it's definitely something that exists <laughs> So Kelly, how now that you've gone through your 10 years, you've kind of decided to move forward with your um, life and what I guess what you want out of life and put that chapter to the side, how do you feel in yourself now? Do you, have you found resolution? How do you yeah, feel? Yeah, def definitely. I think there's um, childlessness is something that kind of we never get over but we learn to live with it's a grief that will sometimes come and hit you out of nowhere like a wave and um, but actually most of the time the majority of the time now I'm in a place where I'm accepting of the situation and um, again because of the sort of the, 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 the tools I've used and um, time is time's a wonderful healer and um, focusing on, again what I can control it's allowed me to be able to find joy um, again which is something that I never thought I'd do um, I use it use the opportunities that we now have to make the most out of make the most of our, out of our freedom to be able to go you know on little trips or do really cra crazy things uh, two days in Budapest at a, 
a concert or whatever I did a few weekends ago, but things that actually I would never have had the opportunity to do. And um, yeah, just having loads of fun, actually, because I have my nieces and nephews, I feel like I have a good balance. So I'm able to have those and do uh, like lovely things with them. Um, But equally, I'm able to um, embrace my life without children, but actually see that there are there are some positives. And um, I was only reading yesterday that there was um, a YouTube blogger who was actually I think she had low ovarian reserves and she was she was hoped she'd frozen her eggs. Unfortunately, she's she's passed away in a scooter accident in London. And it just makes you realise how precious life actually yeah. is yeah. and how grateful we have to be for the things that we do have and it's, I know it's easy to say when you kind of um, I'm at this stage and you know I feel at peace with the situation but actually that hopefully that time will come where you do start to see that actually there are things and it is little steps you know, it's about embracing all the aspects of your life because it can become such an all-consuming process and just start to do little things that bring you joy um, can be really, really useful. And can I ask, Ellie, as far as, without being too personal, as far as the impact on your relationship, because it obviously changes what you imagined your relationship with your husband to be, that 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 parent line isn't something that has has turned out how you'd wanted and I I love you talking about the busyness that you've got with the children that you've got in your life and I'm just interested in the way that has affected the two of you's relationships a bit and if you've had the time to to really kind of nurture that through because of the the grief that that's that's brought on. Um, Again because of the the work that I've done it's allowed my husband to be able to process his grief a little bit more what rather than having it in a um, a little cupboard you know a little a box and um, with the lid shut so he has been able to talk about it we do talk about it it's led to some really interesting conversations at work because of the work that I now do he he will say when people ask him do you have children he'll say no unfortunately not and 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 that will lead it's led to some really powerful conversations where people have said oh we had IVF and um, nobody knows about it and it's almost like lifted that secrecy around it and he would never have had that conversation if it wasn't for our journey and the work that we're now doing because it's not something that um, he would ordinarily do talk about his emotions but I think it's really important to nurture your relationship um, we plan lovely little things in the diary. We've always got something planned. He's incredibly busy at work. Um, but last night, for example, we made sure we went out for a quick walk, um, half an hour's walk, because again, there's no distractions. You can put your phones down. You can just chat about your day and having that time for each other. And um, it's really important because it, when you're going through the fertility journey, it becomes about the baby and you kind of forget about each other a little bit so you know it's really important to nurture that relationship and talk you know is as difficult as it's it's been some of the for example the fertility awareness week has brought out some interesting conversations with us because what I think it was two years ago it was um, fertility in five so I asked him what would your fertility words be in five and he said life moves on without me and that was absolutely heartbreaking to hear. But again, it was an, a way of him expressing that, yeah, you know, we see family members, cousins getting married, having children, and we're kind of still where we were 14, 14 years ago. And that can be quite hard. But equally, we try and make the most of the opportunities that we have. We try and spend time to each, uh, with each other. And I think reminding yourselves, you know, we married each other we didn't marry each other for a family or that was always what I, I'd hoped for um but we still have the experiences together and we share lovely experiences with our nieces and nephews as well so yeah really grateful for that one question Kelly that we asked to all of our guests is what would you say to your younger fertile self so if you in hindsight now could look back on the last 10 years what advice would you give to your younger fertile self? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, 
I would say there's a, a number of things. Um, first of all, and it's something we I've ch- talked about already, try to not let infertility define you because that was the biggest thing that really I found really challenging. Um, the second thing would be to continue to do the things that bring you joy again that we talked about, you know, do do things that you perhaps um, did when you were younger um, and, you know, plan those things in. Make some other plans other than fertility treatment. So it's really important that we have other things in our diaries other than just our next scan and egg collection. And I think the most important thing would be throughout this, remember just to have some fun. Life is supposed to be fun and we can forget to do, we can forget to have fun. We can forget to do the things that bring us joy. Really sound advice. We'll put the details of your organisation and the work that you do with care. It's great to see you spreading out around the UK. I'm hoping that uh, the talks are going to, the, the walks and talks are going to happen in Manchester, where I am. If you're listening outside the UK, please do see if there's this type of thing happening because there are brilliant people doing this around the world because sadly so many people are are affected and kelly within your facebook group i'm assuming there's people from from all over the globe all over the world yeah we've got we're a global community which is amazing so we have meetups all over the world and people within the community meet up with other people they arrange those so yeah it's something that you can get involved with even if you're listening outside the uk great stuff thank you so much lovely to chat you're welcome thank you so really interesting hearing where kelly's at and really great to hear that she's created such a positive thing out of what has been such a a, a sad story ultimately hasn't it i know incredible and she's the, I mean, the work she's doing with um in supporting women and couples is amazing um And definitely we need to see more of that across the country in all different types of clinics. It would be great. Now it's time for one of your questions, which we're always keen to hear. You can email talkfertility at gmail.com. Kate, of course, is a fertility nurse and has great experience working with women on a day-to-day basis. So what's today's question? So today's question is a really interesting one because it's one that I get asked quite a lot. Um, So this lady asks, she says, I have a short luteal phase averaging eight to 10 days. And I was wondering if anyone else has this or if there's any way to increase it. She says, says, I've never managed to get pregnant even with IVF and I obviously want to try all my options to increase my chances. So a luteal phase, just for for those that may be new to trying to conceive, is the phase from ovulation to the next period. And ideally, a good luteal phase should be between 10 and 16 days. And this is so that it supports an implanting pregnancy. And I kind of like to think of of this, of, of the lining of the womb, the endometrium, to be like a comfy duvet. So a nice, comfy, warm duvet that will mean that the embryo then comes in and nestles into the comfy duvet and is nice and secure. So it's really important that that luteal phase is between 10 and 16 days um, and would then continue. If you conceive, then clearly the luteal phase continues. So to get that really nice lining of the womb, there are some things that you can do to help improve that. Now, one of the things that is researched to to improve fertility is acupuncture. And I've seen really good success with acupuncture at increasing a luteal phase. That's one option that you can try naturally. Some women choose to take a supplement called Vitex um, or Agnus Castus. um, And that is a little bit controversial. I wouldn't recommend that women take it without getting advice from um, a herbalist because it's really important to get the right dose for you as it can have a negative effect on fertility. The other things that you can do is increase exercise because that increases um, blood flow to the um, lining of the womb, which is fantastic. And also look at things like fertility massage as that can also really help. So those are the natural things that you can do. So don't forget that if that question has prompted another question, then get back to us on the email, talkfertility at gmail.com and Kate can pick up on it. You can also follow us on our socials. I'm at Fertility Body on Instagram and Twitter. And I'm Your Fertility Journey on Instagram. And on Twitter, I'm at Fert Journey. Make sure you tune in next week. Another insightful conversation, which you can find out more details about at thefertilitypodcast.com forward slash Kelly De Silva. S-I-L-V-A and all of Kelly's details will be on there as well as again how you can keep in touch with me at Fertility Poddy on your socials thank you as always for your support and until the next time <laughs>